Hey there, everybody out there in podcast land. This is Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And before we get started, uh, as a fellow homie, I did want to give a rest in peace to Reggie Osei, who was uh, Combat Jack. He had a podcast for the past seven years, and he was a a pioneer in both the hip-hop industry with the source as an attorney and all, and he's definitely a pioneer in the podcasting realm. He was actually in a heavy influence for me to actually want to do a podcast. But I just wanted to say rest in peace. He passed away earlier today. And, um, yep, so you will be missed, uh, Combat Jack. And today I am actually really, I always say I'm really excited, but Susan Shumsky is the author that we have today. She has a book, A Maharishi and Me, and seeking Enlightenment with the Beatles Guru. And I'm excited to hear from Susan because Susan was in the trenches back in the day. And I know when, when I look at uh, the past, I kind of look at it like it's an idyllic time. It's, it's like no other, and we totally missed the boat. And she was there. You know, she was there with uh, Maharishi in the, in the 60s and with the Beatles, and she was uh, at the ashram for over 20 years, and she also has uh, multiple books as an author. She has written Divine Revelation. She's written Exploring Meditation and Color Your Chakras, among other books. And without further ado, welcome to the podcast, Susan. I'm thrilled to be here with you today, Hamza. Yes. And you are a legend, you know, just doing some <laughs> background research. And I was really excited, like, oh, my goodness, December 20th, couldn't get her fast enough so we can actually <laughs> interview you for the podcast. Awesome. <laughs> I like it because, uh, you know, we, everyone goes through their, their own path, and, and we always highlight how it's not linear at all. And one thing that I actually like is, you know, you've been in, in the self-help slash uh, personal development industry for a very long time, and you've seen a lot of things come. You've seen a lot of things go. You see a lot of things that are uh, consistent and can stand the test of time. And I, I like to just, for the podcast listeners, just give a little bit of background of who you are and, and why I'm just so interested in talking to you, but why they can be interested when they hear you as well. Well, I've been practicing spiritual disciplines for over 50 years, and I was a hippie in the 60s, and after that, I spent a very long time in this ashram with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. In fact, I was in his various ashrams for 22 years, Mm -hmm. and then uh, at some point, I found a way to connect with spirit in a very powerful way, in a different way than I had been doing before. And I started writing books about that. And now I have 14 books in print. So that's basically my life in a nutshell right there. (laughs) It's not so simple when you kind of look back at 2020 (laughs) vision. (laughs) If we could all just blink our eyes or twinkle our nose like on Bewitched and and come to that conclusion. (laughs) Yeah, right. Well, let's go. Let's. Let's go back to uh, what I said, the idyllic, and just looking at some of your reviews on, on Amazon, I mean, you, you've dealt with uh, people from uh, famous rock groups like The Doors, other authors and such, and a lot of people back then look at, oh, my goodness, it was such an idyllic time, um, and, and it's not like that today. What was the environment like back in, the, in your beginning? It was kind of chaotic. <laughs> Vietnam War was going on. There were a lot of protests against that. There was violence in Kent State, and and there was a lot of protesting in Washington, and everyone hated the war. And I was a flower child. It was the 60s. I was a hippie. I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area. And probably people don't realize that we flower children, we were really very serious about spiritual awakening and spiritual enlightenment. That was our focus. And we weren't taking drugs to get high. We were taking 
drugs to have spiritual experiences. And our gurus were people like Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, who later became Ram Das and is still with us even today. And so we were following them and they had written the book, The Psychedelic Experience. And I was reading books like the Buddhist scriptures, uh, books like Cosmic Consciousness, Self-Actualization. I was reading Alan Watts books, The Way of Zen and other books by him. And Alan Watts said that you have to find a meditation guide. Well, in 1966 in Berkeley, California, you didn't exactly go to the yellow pages and look up meditation guide or yoga or anything remotely similar to that. So I asked a roommate, well, how do I find this meditation guide? And he said, well, have you ever tried to meditate on your own by yourself? And I said, well, gee, maybe I'll give it a try. So I lay down on my bed. I didn't even know that you're supposed to sit up when you meditate. That's how clueless I was at the time. I lay on my bed and I sort of prayed for or asked for a meditation. Immediately I was propelled into an ecstatic state. I felt this rush or cord of energy flowing up, up through the midline of my body all the way from the tips of my toes to the top of my head. And I felt like I was plugged into an electric socket but in a most ecstatic way. And I figured, well, I guess this is meditation. Little did I know that I had not only experienced my first meditation, but also Kundalini awakening all at the same time. Yeah. And it was not, wasn't too long after that that somebody took me to the Transcendental Meditation Center. Wow. Where was that center at? Where exactly was that center at? Uh, it was in Berkeley, California. But oh, okay. there wasn't any teacher there. So I had to wait nine months before I could learn Transcendental Meditation. But the moment that I walked into that center and I saw the picture of the guru on the wall, who was Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who is an iconic figure. He was the guru of the Beatles and the guru of Deepak Chopra. Not at that time, though. <laughs> that was before, yeah. before he ever met those people. But I saw the picture on the wall and I immediately became enamored with him. And I thought, this is it. I, you know, now I finally, I'm going to have a meditation guide. Now I'm going to re- learn real meditation. So that's what I did. I learned that. And then three years after that, I was on the banks of the Ganges in India with Maharishi. <laughs> wow. I was young. I was young. <laughs> Right. Well, it, it, it's always funny to hear everyone's story because, you know, you wake up, let's say, on Monday and, and you have this, this, these plans and you wind up being in the ashram around the world for over 20 years. So how did, how did that happen? <laughs> it happened because of, I suppose, a very deep unconscious or perhaps conscious, actually it was quite conscious at the time, desire to experience higher states of consciousness. And like I said, that was our focus in the 1960s. That was the focus of us flower children. I I know people don't really realize that. They think it was just about getting high or whatever, but that really wasn't what it was about. Did you find that there was a, a, you know, usually today uh, it seems like there's more of a, a message of a balance. You know, you're reaching that spiritual awakening, but you also have, one foot in the third dimension, you know, dealing with the day-to-day. How did you marry the two worlds? I didn't. (laughs) At the time, (laughs) I didn't marry any two worlds. I was fully living in in this ashram, meditating from 5 to 20 hours a day. During, During those 22 years that I was involved in that, organization especially the six years when I was on Maharishi's personal staff so during those periods of time I'm like I said I meditated anywhere from five to twenty hours a day I would go into my room and not appear for up to eight weeks at a time I would have the food brought to the door I used to go into silence and would not utter a word for up to four months at a time and I was celibate for decades so basically I was really an introvert and that's an understatement Wow. (laughs) Wow. 
Now, I have a, I have a question. Uh, we had a we had a podcast early on where we were talking about hypersleep, and and with hypersleep, uh, the person that was on, they were introducing the the process of sleeping up to seventy two hours. And when we tried, or I'll just use my personal experience, David can talk, chime in and give his experience, but when I tried the 24 hours, I couldn't do it, but I got up to 16, and it was just phenomenal. And so, and I haven't repeated it, I think probably on some level I, I want to do that, but how did you go from meditating, like your first meditation where it may have been 30, first you were laying down, right, and then you realize that you need to sit up and you had a wonderful experience. How do you go from, you know, a 30-minute meditation to meditating for multiple days? How does that happen? It happens because I was on these meditation retreats and I was surprised, I was shocked when <laughs> I went to this retreat in 1967, in the fall of 1967, and the teacher said, just meditate all day. Just sit on your bed and meditate all day. And, of course, I didn't think I could do that, but I could do it, actually. I found out that I could do it because it was such an easy, effortless form of meditation. The, the meditation was transcendental meditation that I was doing. With my guru, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, was the founder of transcendental meditation. So it was so simple and so restful and so blissful that I enjoyed meditating all those many hours. However, I wouldn't recommend people do that today. In fact, I don't think it's necessary for anybody to meditate that long today. And I'll tell you why. It's because the vibration of this planet has changed so dramatically since mm -hmm. that time, way back mm -hmm. over 50 years ago. It was a different planet. It was a different world. And we needed to meditate that much to cut through the heavy, intensely heavy atmosphere at that time. We needed to meditate and also even meditate in groups in order to begin to change the atmosphere of the planet, which we've successfully done over the last 50 years. The, the planet's a completely different place now than it used to be 50, 60 years ago. I, I don't even recognize it as to what it used to be when I was a child. Completely different. Mm -hmm. What's wow. the difference with transcendental meditation versus a regular meditation or people that are listening on YouTube to a meditation audio? Well, transcendental meditation is a unique form of meditation that uses mantras and that takes you very into a very deep, deep, deep state of silence and deep relaxation and transcendental consciousness. Some of the other meditations that people practice might not be as deep. That's the main difference. And all the physiological changes that take place in transcendental meditation, they've been verified scientifically i'm not advocating by the way transcendental meditation or any particular form of meditation i'm not trying to advocate but there is a difference between tm and other forms of meditation um, so susan let me ask you i myself have been meditating i don't know probably over 30 years and but when i first started i could hardly sit still and, you know, keep my eyes closed for more than a few minutes. And it was a gradual process to, to I got to a point where I could do it for really as long as I want to for hours. But so I was just curious, how long did it take you from, from the, when you first started learning to you could sit, you know, and quiet the mind for an extended amount of time? Because I know you couldn't have just started like that. You had to probably take a little time, right? Well, actually, I learned Transcendental Meditation in August of 1967, and that same fall was when I went on that retreat and meditated for 18 hours a day on that particular retreat. So it was, didn't take me long at all, and, I, and nobody else either. At that time, uh, people who learned TM, they could go on meditation retreats and and do that much meditation. However, on the meditation retreats, today that transcendental meditation offers they don't have people meditate that long i mean that, that was a different time and a different need maharishi asked us to do that mainly to change the atmosphere of the planet it was his goal was for people to meditate and change the planet change the world and create world peace that was his motivation was creating world peace 
and he and his philosophy he said that in order for the forest to be green all the trees must be green in order for us to have a peaceful world we have to create peaceful individuals so that was his motive in teaching meditation at the time Mm. and he succeeded by the way he was successful in that absolutely so when you when you went to uh, India and you were at the ashram, were you like one of the only Americans or were there other Americans? Most of the people on the course that I was on were Americans, I would say. Although there were there were a wide range of Europeans there as well. But on the, on my course in 1970, early 1970 in Rishikesh, India, I'd say it was mostly Americans. Mm-hmm. So when you went there, when you went, let me ask this real quick. When you went there, did you have any idea you're going to be there for 20 years? Was that kind of the plan, or was just going to be here until I'm not here? No, no, I, that was not my plan at all. I was planning to come, go to that course. It was a three month course, and then go back. But after the three months, people started leaving, and other people left, and other people, and finally, there was only about 15 of us left. And that was in April of uh, 1970. And then it got whittled down to there were only six people left. And then Marishi was going to go to South India to teach a teacher training course to some some Indians down there. And there were only six of us. And I ended up going there with him to help him or assist him on that teacher training course in Bangalore, India. And that was the start of my more intimate, shall we say, master-disciple relationship with Maharishi was going down there to Bangalore with him. Uh Okay. So being a right-hand man, right, being a right-hand man, if you will, I mean, you had a lot of, like you said, intimate relations. Um, In in your profile, you were mentioning that... (laughs) You had an insider's look at the dysfunctional organization. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, that was much later. Um, way back in the beginning, in the 19, uh, in 1970, at that time, there really wasn't much of an organization that Maharishi had. It was much later, in the 1980s, that I really had a disillusionment over the way that the entire organization was set up and how much control and cultish atmosphere and kind of coercion that was going on and really heavy-handed control over the whole thing. And that was when I was living in Fairfield, Iowa, so I had a kind of a disillusionment about about the organization at that time. Hmm. It's interesting because when you, we, you know, we've interviewed a few people and just in uh, observing just uh, other groups, there's always this euphoria when they are introduced to a new school of thought. And then it seems in, inevitably that there is some disillusionment because there seems to be some type of control. And I think you grow to a point where you're like, okay, this is a great body of information. I'm going to take it and move on. And you may outgrow the group. Uh, Do you see a similar pattern? Uh, Yes. And thank you for expressing it that way, because I do believe that was what happened in my case. It's not that I rejected transcendental meditation because I think and I still recommend it to people and I believe that it is an excellent excellent form of meditation however because of the this what turned it out to be kind of like a cult and because people lived in fear uh, in Fairfield Iowa in fact I nicknamed it Fearfield Iowa because it became it there was so much coercion and and so much guilt inducing kind of propaganda that was going on it's like we have to save the world and if we don't uh, do this meditation practice together in the golden domes in fairfield iowa 
then it's our fault that any there's any breakout of war in the world and you know it, there was a lot of tremendous guilt and fear and that kind of motivation and people were terrified to lose their privileges of going to the dome and meditating and it just turned out to be like I said fear field instead of fair field and that wasn't fun <laughs> after a while it wasn't fun anymore and and anyway, by that time, I had learned another type of meditation that was that I found to be incredibly powerful, and which is the form that I teach now. And I'm very very happy with that. But still, recommend transcendental meditation because it's it's a very profound ex- uh, form of meditation for people really learning how to experience deep meditation, deep silence, samadhi, sat chit ananda, absolute bliss consciousness. So. I highly recommend Transcendental Meditation. I just don't think people should get involved with the organization because it's just not Mm -hmm. great. What kind of meditation are you teaching now? I'm teaching something called Divine Revelation. And that's really a very simple method of asking and receiving from spirit of experiencing the still small voice within experiencing the divine presence directly without going through any middleman and just having that direct divine communication and contact. Okay. And you talk about that and awaken your divine intuition. I do in my book. Yeah. Awaken your divine intuition. I talk about that. And in my book, divine revelation as well in those two books. All right. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I teach the technique in those books. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it reminds me of when I visited a, a, a Buddhist temple we have here in Atlanta, and there were two schools of thought of if you're in meditation, you should sit, uh, you should be sitting. And then at this temple, there was more of a walking meditation. And then the other the other uh, school of thought that they were having was your eyes should be closed when you're meditating. But at this temple, they were saying, well, if it's a walking meditation, you're walking, your eyes should be open in front of you because this is the third dimension. Um, and you have to master that through your divine revelation. So where do you fit in that quagmire of thought? Well, there's many, many things that are called meditation. And some of them are with eyes open or eyes closed or walking or sitting, standing, whatever. But if you want to experience samadhi, uh, at least at first, it's a good idea to sit and close your eyes and go deep, deep, deep into meditation. Uh, I think people who are beginners really need to have that experience of deep transcendental consciousness. And that is going within. It's turning your senses within rather than all the day long. You've got your senses outward. You're looking at things, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling things on the outside. But if you want to experience transcendental transcendental consciousness, which means going beyond this physical realm, going beyond the realm that takes you in an outward direction, you have to go 180 degrees within into the inner direction. And one really fast way to do that is close your eyes <laughs> because you're immediately cutting off that major sense input from the outside. And so you're starting to go within. And then you might take a few deep breaths to go deeper within. That helps you to go into the deep state of silence when you take some deep breaths. And an important thing to realize about meditation is to not expect that you're going to stop thinking because the mind is continually thinking anyway. So it's really more of a settling down to inner peace and relaxation of the body and quietude of the mind doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to stop thinking. So people who try to control the mind, that is anti-meditation. That's anti-getting deep into meditation. Control and expectations and trying that does not work oh. that's twice you mentioned in, in iowa right the control <laughs> and if you're trying to control the meditation it just seems uh you're always shooting yourself in the foot metaphorically if you're trying to control a situation would you agree uh, yes that's true 
especially with meditation, because meditation is about letting go. It's about experiencing expanded awareness rather than more focused awareness. So what you want to do is let go, relax and let go, take deep breaths, relax, let go. And, you know, it's really quite simple to do. It's just a matter of asking and receiving, getting quiet, asking and receiving. So, Susan, how long, once you got to India and you started doing the meditation, well, now, how long before you would you say you started, that third eye kind of started opening up, you started seeing auras and spirits and whatnot? I can't say that in all the 22 years that I was in the ashram that I ever had those kinds of experiences. It wasn't until I learned from another teacher, Peter Meyer of San Diego, who was the founder of Teaching of Intuitional Metaphysics and who wrote the book Being a Christ, I learned from him uh, how to develop my subtle sensory perception, meaning clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience. And I learned how to do that starting in 1986 when I was still living in Fairfield, Iowa, in the TM ashram, I started learning from Peter Meyer. And that was when I started to develop these, what I call subtle sensory perceptions. And so it's something that I learned how to do. Wow. I would have thought for, I guess my perception was if you're in India, whatever, that was probably a part of it all, learning how to, to, you know, see, use the third eye and whatnot. But it wasn't, I guess. No, uh, my my meditation during those 22 years in the ashram was just simply going into transcendental consciousness, which is the state of samadhi, which means st- stillness of mind, uh, quietude of body, going into, into the deep transcendental state and experiencing unbounded awareness. And that is a wonderful experience. It's really the end-all, be-all experience of of yoga, experience of yoga, meaning union, union with the divine, union with the transcendental uh, awareness. Oh. Oh. You had an, another great quote when you are talking about the samadhi and the, and the stillness of mind. Um, I, I'd like to read this part. It says that you were saying when you're with the, the Maharishi being in his presence, we disciples and entered an utterly timeless place and rapturous feeling, and at the same time realized the utter futility and insanity of the mundane world. Uh, Yes, uh, that is what I experienced being around Marcy. Marcy was a very, very unusual person, not like other people. (laughs) He was really quite extraordinary, and I do believe that he was a great saint, And being in his presence was stepping into a timeless, spaceless experience. It was an experience of bliss consciousness. I don't know how to describe that. It just means it's beyond happiness. It's more like uh, paradise. Experience of paradise would be how you might describe being in his presence. And at the same time, nothing existed outside of that space and time when you were with him. And, and strangely, another added benefit was this feeling that the world is, is meaningless and is not real. So it was a very unusual experience. And I think many people have tried to describe what it was like being around Maharishi, but I, in my book, Maharishi and Me, I really go into incredible depth about what it was like being, being around him. And it was, a, it was just a very unusual, very profound experience that really changed me in so many ways that I can't even describe and don't even know about. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was thinking as we, you know, we're bouncing back from, you know, your time there and then your time post that, 
And it, it led me to think about when you were with Peter Meyer and you started getting access to your Claire's, um, the way I, the way I'm listening to you, it feels like um, when you were at the ashram, it was more of looking out, not so much looking outside because you did get a lot of benefit from it internalizing during, through meditation, but it was more of, can I reach that level that the Maharishi is reaching? And I'm wondering if, you know, once you started getting access to your clairs, if you felt that you were getting close to that from your own experience. I think you really hit the nail on the head there. And uh, I would call you by name if I could tell the difference between your two, <laughs> two, two voices. But whoever I'm talking to right now, whether it be David or Hamsa, uh, yes, I think you really hit the nail on the head. And it was really uh, very different to experience this kind of self-empowerment. And that's the reason mm-hmm. why I teach what I teach now, because it's more about not going through any middleman, but experiencing this yourself and having your own awakening and your own connection with spirit with a capital S, being able to realize that still small voice within you and having your own direct pipeline to God yourself rather than going through a guru or a saint or a rabbi or a priest or a pastor or anything outside of yourself or a religion or anything outside of yourself, but experiencing that yourself within you and realizing who you really are, identifying yourself as that divine spirit rather than looking to something else as being that divine spirit. Yeah, it's interesting because we, uh, we introduced or we interviewed uh, Jim mm-hmm. Self a couple of podcasts ago and, you know, he, he's been around since, you know, the six, uh, 60s and 70s as well. And he was mentioning the current environment in, in that there's many, like you mentioned, you don't need to meditate as long as you did back then. And with the veil being a lot thinner, you have more and more, a growing number of people that are able to channel. And so people are, are drawn to those channelers. And... Jim made the reference that you guys are starting to look outside yourself again, just looking for answers from a channel as opposed to, as you so eloquently posted, uh, your own pipeline and and developing those tools yourself. Well, you are your own channel to God. The truth is that you have the power yourself to experience that divine presence, and you don't need to go to a psychic or a channeler or anybody, you can receive that from within yourself. And that is exactly what I teach. That's exactly what divine revelation is about, is learning how to listen to that inner voice so that you're not dependent on these external sources of information. You're really your own best psychic. You're really your own best channeler yourself. Yeah, I agree. So what what exactly do you teach, um, Susan? Well, I teach people how to hear that inner voice. I don't just teach them how to do it. I help them actually to do that. I teach something called a breakthrough experience, which is a deep meditation where they uh, have their own experience of this higher self, this inner presence, this this connection to spirit. And they receive their own uh, inner, inner experience, receive their own messages, receive specific signals to identify divine beings that they're in touch with. And it's a profound experience of awakening for people where they, where they open to that inner voice. They open to God within them. Do they come see you at different locations around the country, or you do this electronically now? I do. I do sp- uh, speaking engagements. Yes, I do speaking engagements, and I also do telephone. If people want the breakthrough experience, if they want the personal attention, I do that over the phone or on Skype. You know, if they want to have that experience, I do it that way. Perfect. I have a question about the more things change, the more they stay the same. And you had mentioned, I want to go back in time for a second. You had mentioned back 
back then in the 60s, a lot of people thought that you guys were, you know, the flower children were just doing drugs, right? And you're saying you're trying to reach a, a psychedelic experience. And in 2017, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, in the, or I guess on the Internet and in the news, about microdosing and, and people looking to access, you know, greater realms, just not heavy-handed or using lessons learned from the 60s so they can have a better experience. And then, you know, there's groups that are like, I can't meditate at all. I really need to microdose or, you know, use ayahuasca or, or any, any other stimulant as opposed to meditation. Um, you've been in both environments. So could you share some feedback of uh, what it was like using stimulants back then and, and today? I, I don't, I don't want to assume, but I would think that you weren't, you're not relying on those stimulants anymore. Yeah, I stopped taking any kind of uh, recreational chemicals in 1967. I stopped doing that. So I, I didn't do, do it for very long. I, I only did it for a few months. And by the way, it drove me out of my mind anyway. I certainly didn't want to continue going insane. So, no, it, it didn't work out very well for me. So, um, but... I really am opposed to any kind of chemical uh, psychedelics or chemical anything. Uh, it, you know, it kills your brain cells. It's, it's really not good for you. Uh, it drove me crazy. It also ruined my ability to concentrate. It, uh, I had been a straight A student and all of a sudden I was getting C's. Uh, you know, I'd never had C's in my life, but the drug really took their toll on me. It was very, very bad for me. And I do not recommend, you know, I've seen people, I've uh, seen what happens from drugs, and it's, it's, not, it's not a good thing. So I don't recommend people do that, and it's not necessary. You can have all the experience, all the, you can travel to all the incredible realms. You can experience everything through your own third eye. You can experience transcendental awareness. You can experience God. You can experience angels, archangels, divine beings. You can open the doorways to all the realms just by meditating and asking for it. It's really that simple. It's not necessary for anyone to take drugs in order to have these experiences. Now, you did mention people say, oh, I can't meditate. Well, maybe they haven't tried a meditation that's, that works for them, that's easy for them. Anyone can meditate. It's just a matter if, of having the desire to learn and finding a meditation that works for you. Mm-hmm. So, Susan, how did, that, how did your family uh, uh, receive? you know, receive you going to India and then next thing you know, you're there for 20 years. Do they think like you were in a cult or how was that on that end of things? When I first told my mom that I had been accepted for the course in India, she was thrilled. In fact, when I first learned meditation, she was absolutely thrilled about the whole thing because I was no longer taking drugs. I was no longer screwing around with every man I could possibly meet. I was no, no longer doing all the groovy things that we did back in the 60s. So she was in ecstasy over the entire prospect. So she was happy that I went off to India. Uh, I did spend a long time, though, being uh, out of the country uh, for about seven years, I think, or so, I was not in the United States. I was in Europe with Maharishi uh, in India, Europe, and uh, so I was gone for a long time. They weren't too thrilled about that, but, uh, you know, they, they didn't seem to mind. And they certainly, I don't know that anybody even knew about cults back then. I don't know that they thought it was in a cult because they probably had never even heard that word. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, it was a different time. Things were very different back then. Hmm. Did you live in the Haight-Ashbury uh, section in San Francisco? 
I did not live there. I would visit there. And I used to go to Golden Gate Park to the B-Ins. I used to go to the Avalon Ballroom and the Fillmore Auditorium to go to the psychedelic concerts there with all the various bands like The Who and Janis Joplin and The Cream and, and The Grateful Dead and, you know, yep. a long list, long list. Jefferson Airplane, you know, I went on. And also I went to Altamont. I was at Altamont with the Rolling Stones when there was that big kind of riot and those people got murdered there. They got murdered just a few feet away from me. Oh uh, my gosh! Not they. The one guy, the one guy got got murdered. It was very yeah, close yeah. Enough. I think it was that Angels. Murder. Wow, that you were there. I was there. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm originally myself. I'm from San Jose, so I grew up in the, you know, the Bay Area there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. All right. <laughs> So that was then in the Bay Area. Do you find yourself still hanging out in, in that general area, or um, where, where do you find yourself going to these days? Well, actually, I live in an RV, and I have no home base. In fact, I've lived in a van, a trailer, or a motorhome since 1989. Wow. So basically, I'm a gypsy, basically still a hippie, still a gypsy. And uh, and I live in a beautiful RV, actually. It's not a van anymore. It's really a nice 40-foot RV. It's a gorgeous RV. But but I don't have a home base, so I live in the RV. Mm. And was that something you, you consciously looked at from, from the 60s and 70s as far as not having any, any attachment? I didn't think of it so much as not having attachment, just... Just the idea of being able to travel anywhere I want at any time and to be able to tour around when I want to go to different places to speak and so forth. And also there's a tremendous amount of freedom, I think, in having your home on wheels. I I like the lifestyle. Uh, Personally, obviously, I like it. I wouldn't have done it since 1989. That's a long time. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It, it reminds me of um, – I listen to a lot of Abraham, and yeah. so they always talk about uh, relationships and and that they're never really finite, but they – at least in this incarnation, they may have a beginning and an end, and whenever you get with someone energetically, it's like, oh, okay, we're going to enjoy ourselves for this moment in time, and then we'll ride that wave as long as we can, and then, you know – part ways. Is is that what you found since 1989 as well? Oh, I haven't really been involved uh, in in romantic kind of relationships. It's not really of great interest to me in my life. Not now, anyway. Yeah. So I have to ask, you were at the ashram when the Beatles came? No, I, I was not in Rishikesh when the Beatles went there in 1968, but I've done a tremendous amount of research and know exactly what happened during that time that people don't really know about. It's, uh, it, people have some very strange ideas about <laughs> what went on that didn't really, wasn't really true. Yeah. H- how long were they there for? Okay, well, Ringo was there for two weeks. Paul was there for one month. George and John were there for two months. That was in 1968, from February uh, till uh, April of 1968. Yeah, okay. So, like, for example, Ringo, was it like, all right, two weeks, I had enough of this, I'm out of here, or? With Ringo, what happened was they had very young children at the time. His wife had just given birth six months before, so obviously they missed their kids. Yeah. But also, he was a little bit disillusioned by the ashram. Uh, Number one, his wife hated insects, and she would force uh, him to kill all the insects and dispose of their carcasses. And she was held at bay by one single fly one time until he got back to the room. Uh, She was, that's how scared she was of insects. But there oh, were serious insects there, like scorpions and centipedes and millipedes and so on. 
and uh, she didn't like that. And also, he didn't like the food. He had packed one suitcase full of Heinz beans and the other suitcase full of clothing so that he could, he hoped he'd be able to stay there. But he, the food didn't, didn't suit him. He had a stomach issue. And so, uh, but then the other thing was their roadie, Mal Evans, was there. And Mal managed to sneak in eggs for Ringo's breakfast uh, because eggs are not allowed in the ashram. They're not allowed anywhere in that area. Hardvar and Rishikesh, no meat or eggs are allowed to be sold there whatsoever. So after Ringo uh, had his breakfast of eggs, the, the, uh, the, uh, some people who worked in the ashram were caught burying the eggshells. And Ringo <laughs> didn't like the idea that when he found out that he, he didn't know that it was illegal to have eggs in the ashram. And when he found out that they had snuck them in for him, he said, well, can't God see that too? And so that upset him. And that incident was, I think, the straw that broke the camel's back. And they left after two weeks. But Ringo did say that he benefited a lot from meditation. He really liked it. And in recent years, he's even said that what he got from Maharishi was this mantra and that no one could ever take that away from him and that it was a very precious thing to him. But he valued it greatly. So why do you think Paul just stayed for a month as opposed to two months like John and George? Paul had to leave because his girlfriend at the time, Jane Asher, had a theatrical commitment and they had to go back to London. Oh. So that was his reason for leaving. But he, he also said that he had great experiences and he was very happy about the whole experience. He wrote quite a few songs when they were in Rishi Cash. Those song, the songs ended up being on the White Album. Yeah. People call it the White Album. The album is actually called The Beatles. Oh, okay. Interesting. I'm just think, I'm thinking with all that silence, of course, yeah, you can get a lot of downloads. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, with the RV life and what have you, it doesn't sound like you have the trappings of, of what we go through today, uh, I, always, I like to say uh, weapons of mass distraction where people are walking <laughs> around, right? they're just attached to their phones, you know, they're, they're, no one's really present at all. Uh, how, how have you been able to fight against that? Weapons of mass distraction. Well, I'll tell you, living in an ashram for all those years really trains you to, to lead a simple life and not to have great needs for just some distraction. So I'm a, quite a happy person just having a simple life and being by myself almost all the time. I actually enjoy my, I actually enjoy my own company. And, um, but I do work a lot on the computer because I write books, obviously. And I'm a very busy person because not only do I write books, I also produce seminars at sea and tours to sacred destinations. So I'm very, very busy. I don't really have a whole lot of time for many distractions or weapons of mass distraction or anything. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm thinking people will look at you as a beacon. You know, there's, a, there's this argument or you have, you know, schools of thought where people are preppers and they're just waiting for, you know, when the grid goes under and no one has access to, you know, our digital landscape. And they'll look at you like, oh, wow, she's a mystic. And you're like, no, I just live a really simple life, <laughs> as you guys yeah. can go back to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, a, a, few, weeks ago, a few weeks ago we had a, a woman on, and she, um, she was like a life coach, and she had a few other things. But one of the things she mentioned in the, in the interview was she hadn't watched TV for like, uh, what was the Hamza, 25 years, 20, 25 years? Yeah, 20 years. Yeah, about 20 years. So, like, when, for example, and I think she's living in Mexico, but, like, when the Hurricane Katrina came and went, it was, like, at least a week or two weeks before she even found out about it. Oh, you my know, goodness. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. She just like kind of stays off all that. And uh, but anyway, it was like wow. I hadn't watched TV in like twenty something years. That's pretty incredible. Well, sounds like she's very proud of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought that I was impressed. <laughs> I was like, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> I think David brings up a really good point in that she she felt that she was guided to leave Mexico at the time. She didn't know that 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 travesty was going to happen, but something led her to leave, and so she didn't know what had happened. But you know, she had gotten the download that she shouldn't be there, and so That's she has a really she has a really good relationship, you know, with her guides and such. So right. uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, once you, from the 80s and such, you had, uh, working again with Peter Meyer, he helped develop uh, your access to the Claire's. I wanted to know if, because uh, you were talking about access to divine beings and angels, have you felt like uh, there have been relationships where there are some divine beings or angels that were with you then that are no longer there because, you know, your level of consciousness changed or... What has been your experience in relationships with uh, divine beings and angels? Well, there are certain divine beings that we work with that are there for a specific purpose, maybe for a briefer period of time. And then there are other ones that seem to hang around, seem to, we seem to work with for much longer periods of time. So it really depends on our needs at the time. And I am very intimate with divine beings who help me on a daily basis in very, very extremely practical ways. I really ask about everything. I ask for guidance about everything in my life, and I do receive guidance from that divine voice within and from the divine beings that are, that are guiding me. So I do have, an inner, have inner guru or inner gurus, I guess you could say plural, who help me, who guide me, who show me the way, who really give me advice on a daily basis. That's, you know, it's not just sometimes I ask, it's that I ask about almost everything in my life and I uh, receive guidance continually. That's fantastic. It, it makes me think of a, an old story where I think it was a, a Jesus story. Somebody was calling out to Jesus because something had happened and they it really needed his attention <laughs> and he was like i'm always here it's just that you know when you wake up you may think of me or before you go to bed and you're asking me to help you out of this problem but you put me on a shelf throughout the day <laughs> until you need if there's any emergency and it sounds like you know with you and some others that we've interviewed that you have an ongoing um, both in your waking moments and while you're asleep and and growing your uh, eternal relationships. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I think it's, I mean, it has been so enriching for my life to have the relationship with spirit, with a capital S, with the divine presence within me, and to be able to receive daily guidance and listen to that inner voice and have profound experiences whenever I ask for them and to have healing whenever I ask for it and to have wisdom and answers to questions and uh, advice that will help me in different areas of my life. Very practical, extremely practical. Has there been an instance where e- e- traditionally some people would say, oh, something told me I needed to leave a, a circumstance or something or I should have made a left or I shouldn't go to this place and they ignored it. Do you, do you mm-hmm. still find yourself in circumstances where you may get an inkling, but something drives you to still go through with what your ego thought you should do? That's an excellent question, and I'm going to tell you a story. If we have time, I'll tell you a little story of what happened to me. And that was that uh, it was in the 19, let's see, early 1990s, and a Spirit had told me to get a, jo- a job as a security guard at this industrial park. So I parked my trailer at the time. I had a trailer, an Airstream trailer at the time, one of those silver bullet looking things. So I parked it there in the industrial park and I got this job as a security guard. So there I am with my little hat, my badge, my little outfit, and I'm I'm sitting at the security post. 
And when you're a security guard, you don't have a heck of a lot to do. So I brought, I would bring my computer there and work on editing a book, the book I was writing at the time. And, and that worked out really well for about a year because I was doing the security job and also working on the book, at the book at the same time. And then after about a year, my uh, higher self, uh, God within me, whatever you want to call it, uh, told me to quit the job. And I kept getting this message, quit the job, quit the job, quit the job. And I kept ignoring the message. As a matter of fact, I called up my friend who also uh, teaches and practices and teaches divine revelation. And I said to him, hey, I'm getting this message to quit the job, but I've decided not to quit because I'm living in fear. I'm afraid that if I quit my stupid minimum wage job that I'll starve and I won't be able to support myself. So I said this to my friend, and he said, well, you know, Susan, you are the teacher of divine revelation. Don't you think it would be a good idea for you to, you know, do what the Spirit is telling you to do? I said, yeah, it would be a good idea, but I'm, I'm just not going to do it. So I didn't quit the job, and I continued. And then one day my relief didn't come to work. And, you know, if you're a security, in security, you have to wait till your relief comes. So I called up the supervisor and I said, my relief is not here. What do I do? And he said, you have to wait. Just wait. So I'm waiting half an hour, waiting an hour. Relief doesn't come. So I called the security guy back and I said, hey, you know, I've got to leave. I have a meditation class I have to teach. I have to go into New York City. I've got to teach this. And I have to leave. I can't stay here. He said, just wait. Your relief will be there in half an hour. So the relief did not come. Bottom line, I abandoned my post. I left because I I had to teach my meditation class. So I left. And then the next day I called back the supervisor and said, you know, I had to leave. Uh, My relief didn't, you know, didn't come. But I had to leave because I had to teach my class. And he said, you are terminated. As soon as he said, I'm terminated, my inner teachers, my spiritual guides, my angels, whatever you want to call them, they started having a party. There were balloons <laughs> going off and confetti and they were dancing and singing and, oh, clapping, and she got rid of her dumb job. So then I didn't even pay attention to the party. As a matter of fact, I called the supervisor back and I begged for my job back. And strangely enough, he gave it back to me. And so the very next night, I'm closing the gates, the big iron gates at the end of the night. And it's really, it's already dark. And I'm closing the front gate and closing the middle gate and went to the back gate. And the back gate is this big wrought iron, eight foot tall gate. And I'm pulling on the gate and it's not closing. How, why isn't this gate closing? It's so weird. It always closed before. And so I'm pulling on the gate, and all of a sudden, the gate started toppling over on top of me. So it knocked me down. It knocked me on the ground. It pinned my legs under the gate, and it was an eight-foot, like I said, wrought iron Mm -hmm. gate, too heavy for me to even budge or move. Thank goodness, thank you, God, that someone came. It was quite an abandoned area, and it was at night. It was dark. And he had to come back to work to pick something up. And he heard me screaming bloody murder under this gate. He came over and he was able to lift the gate just a few inches so that I could get out from under it. I scooted out from under the gate. And then he said, do not move. Thank God this man told me, do not move. I said, oh, I'll just get up. I'm fine. I'm just bruised. He said, do not move. So he called the EMT. They came. They cut off my uniform and wrapped me in a sheet and put me in the ambulance. And it turned out my leg had nearly been severed in half. It was only holding on by a few sinews. I had to have four operations on my leg. Thank God I can walk. Thank God the scar, scar really, it's a big scar, but it barely shows. And I fully recovered really from that injury. But That's what happens when you don't listen to the still small voice within, which keeps telling you over and over again, quit the job. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) So you wanted the story. There there it is. There's the story. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Wow. All right. (laughs) Wow. 
on my Instagram feed, uh, you know, in my weapons of mass distraction, yes, I still have an Instagram feed. But <laughs> so, you know, today's Wednesday, and it's known as Wayne Dyer Wednesday. And Wayne Dyer is quoted as saying, all of the great teachers have left us with a similar message. Go within, discover your invisible higher self, and know God as the love that is within you. And I think that speaks highly to our podcast that we had today with uh, Susan Chumsky. She is the author of 14 books, uh, and her latest book is Maharishi and Me, Seeking Enlightenment with the Beatles Gurus. So definitely check that out on, on Amazon. You can find her other books there as well. You've been in tune to another podcast of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And, and it was definitely a pleasure, Susan. Um, if you'd like to give out your website and let us know about any upcoming events you had as well, you have coming as well, that'd be fantastic. I have two websites. Uh, one is drsusan.org. That's drsusan.org. And that is where you can read the first chapter of uh, almost all my books where you can listen to radio interviews, read articles, and buy products. Also, I have another website called divinetravels.com, and that's D-I-V-I-N-E-T-R-A-V-E-L-S.com. That's plural on the travels, divinetravels.com. On that website, you can find out about the sacred tours, tours to sacred destinations, amazing cruise ship seminars with really famous speakers that I offer. And uh, there's just a lot of different places that you can visit that are sacred places in, in the world. And you can do so on that website. Fantastic. It, it was a pleasure, Susan. We love talking to you. Love yes. talking to you too. It's great fun. Yes. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.